Chapter 15 of Tales of the Enchanted Islands of the Atlantic. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Timothy Ferguson. Tales of the Enchanted Islands of the Atlantic by Thomas Higson. Chapter 15 Antilia, the Isle of the Seven Cities. The young Spanish page, Luis de Viga, had been for some months at the court of Don Rodrigo, King of Spain, when he heard the old knights lamenting, as they came out of the palace at Toledo, over the king's last and most daring whim. He means, said one of them in a whisper, to penetrate the secret cave of the Gothic kings, that cave on which each successive sovereign has put a padlock. Till there are now twenty-seven of them, interrupted a still older knight. And he means, said the first, frowning at the interruption, to take thence the treasures of his ancestors. Indeed, he must do it, said another, else the son of his ancestors will have no treasure left of his own. But there is a spell upon it, said the other. For ages Spain has been threatened with invasion, and it is the old tradition that the only talisman which can prevent it is in the cave. Well, said the scoffer, it is only by entering the cave that he can possess the talisman. But if he penetrates to it, his power is lost. A pretty talisman, said the other if it is only of use to anybody so long as no one sees it. Were I the king, I would hold it in my hands, and I have counselled him to heed no greybeards but to seize the treasure for himself. I have offered to accompany him. May it please your lordship, said the eager Lewis, may I go with you? Yes, said Don Alonso de Caragas, turning to the ardent boy. Where the king goes, I go, and where I go, thou shalt be my companion. See, si, senors, he said, turning to the others, how the ready faith of boyhood puts your fears to shame. To his majesty the terrors of this goblin cave are but a jest which frightens the old and only rouses the young to courage. The king may find the recesses of the cavern filled with gold and jewels. He who goes with him may share them. This boy is my first recruit. Who follows? By this time a whole group of courtiers, young and old, had assembled around Don Alonso, and every man below thirty years was ready to pledge himself to the enterprise, but the older courtiers and the Archbishop Opas were beseeching the king to refrain. Respect, O king, they said, the custom held sacred by twenty-seven of thy predecessors. Give us but an estimate of the sum that may, in thy kingly mind, represent the wealth that is within the cavern walls, and we will raise it on our own domains, rather than see the sacred tradition set at naught. The king's only answer was, follow me. Don Alonso hastily sending the boy Lewis to collect the younger knights who had already pledged themselves to the enterprise. A gallant troop, they made their way down the steep steps which led from the palace to the cave. The news had spread, the ladies had gathered on the balconies, and the bright face of one laughing girl looked from a bower window, while she tossed a rose to the happy Lewis. Alas, it fell short of its mark and hit the robes of Archbishop Opus, who stood with frowning face as the youngster swept by. The archbishop crushed it unwittingly in the hand that held the crozier. The rusty padlocks were broken, and each fell clanking on the floor and was brushed away with mailed heels. They passed from room to room with torches, for the cavern extended far beneath the earth, yet found no treasure save the jeweled table of Solomon. But for their great expectations, this table might alone have proved sufficient reward for their act of daring. Some believed that it had been bought by the Romans from Solomon's temple and from Rome by the Goths and Vandals, who sacked that city, and afterwards conquered Spain. But all believed it to be sacred, and now saw it to be gorgeous. Some described it as being of gold set with precious stones, others of gold and silver, making it yellow and white in hue, ornamented with a row of pearls, a row of rubies, and another row of emeralds. It is generally agreed it stood on 360 feet, each made of a single emerald. Being what it was, the king did not venture to remove it, but left it where it was. Traversing chamber after chamber and finding all empty, they at last found all passages leading to the innermost apartment, which had a marble urn in the centre. Yet all eyes presently turned from this urn to a large painting on the wall, which displayed a troop of horsemen in full motion. Their horses were of Arab breed, their arms were scimitars and lances, with fluttering pennons, they wore turbans, and their coarse black hair fell over their shoulders. They were dressed in skins. Never had there been seen by the courtiers a mounted troop so wild, so eager, so formidable. Turning from them to the marble urn, the king drew from it a parchment which said, These are the people who, 
whenever this cave is entered, and the spell contained in this urn is broken, shall possess this country. An idle curiosity has done its work. The rash king, covering his eyes with his hands, fled outward from the cavern. His knights followed him, but Don Alonso lingered last, except the boy Louis. Nevertheless, my lord, said Louis, I should like to strike a blow at these bold barbarians. We may have an opportunity, said the gloomy knight. He closed the centre gate of the cavern, and tried to replace the broken padlocks, but it was in vain. In twenty-four hours the story had travelled over the kingdom. The boy Louis little knew into what a complex plot he was drifting. In the secret soul of his protector Don Alonso, there burned a great anger against the weak and licentious king. He and his father, Count Julian, and Archbishop Opas, his uncle, were secretly brooding plans of wrath against Don Rodrigo for his ill-treatment of Don Alonso's sister, Florinda. Rumours told them that an army of strange warriors from Africa, who had hitherto carried all before them, were threatening to cross the straits not yet called Gibraltar and descend on Spain. All the ties of fidelity held these courtiers to the king, but they secretly hated him and wished for his downfall. By the next day, they had planned to betray him to the Moors. Count Julian had come to make his military report to Don Rodrigo, and on some pretext had withdrawn Florinda from the court. "'When you come again,' said the pleasure-loving king, "'bring me some hawks from the south, that we may go hawking.' "'I will bring you hawks enough,' was the answer, "'and such as you never saw before. "'But Rodrigo,' says the Arabian chronicler, "'did not understand the full meaning of his words.' It was a hard blow for the young Lewis when he discovered what a plot was being urged around him. He would gladly have been faithful to the king, worthless as he knew him to be, but Don Alonso had been his benefactor, and he held by him. Meanwhile, the conspiracy drew towards completion, and the Arab force was drawing nearer to the straits. A single foray into Spain had shown Musa, the Arab general, the weakness of the kingdom, that the cities were unfortified, the citizens unarmed, and many of the nobles lukewarm towards the king. Hasten, he said, towards that country where the palaces are filled with gold and silver, and the men cannot fight in their defence. Accordingly, in the early spring of the year 711, Musa sent his next in command, Tariq, to cross to Spain with an army of 7,000 men, consisting mostly of chosen cavalry. They crossed the straits then called the Sea of Narrowness, embarking the troops at Tangier and Ceuta in many merchant vessels, and landing at that famous promontory, called thenceforth by the Arab general's name, the Rock of Tariq, Deshebel Tariq, or more briefly, Gibraltar. Louis, under Don Alonso, was with the Spanish troops sent hastily down to resist the Arab invaders, and as these troops were mounted, he had many opportunities of seeing the new enemies and observing their ways. They were a picturesque horde. Their breasts were covered with male armour, they wore white turbans on their heads, carried their bows slung across their backs, and their swords suspended to their girdles while they held their long spears, firmly grasped in their hands. The Arabs said that their fashion of mail armour had come to them from King David, to whom, they said, God made iron soft, and it became in his hands as thread. More than half of them were mounted on the swift horses, which were peculiar to their people, and the white, red, and black turbans and cloaks made a most striking picture around the campfires. These men, too, were already trained and successful soldiers, held together by a common religion and by the hope of spoil. There were twelve thousand of them by the most probable estimate, for Musa had sent reinforcements, and they had against them from five to eight times their number, but of the Spaniards only a small part were armed or drilled or used to warfare, and great multitudes of them had put their reliance in clubs, slings, axes, and short scythes. The cavalry were on the wings, where Lewis found himself, with Count Julian and Archbishop Opus to command them. Soon, however, Don Alonso and Louis were detached, with others, to act as escort to the king, Don Rodrigo. The battle began soon after daybreak on Sunday, the 19th of July, 711. As the troops advanced, their trumpets sounded defiance and were answered by Moorish horns and kettle drums. While they drew near, the shouts of the Spaniards were drowned in the lelai of the Arabs. The phrase, La ilaha ilaha, there is no deity but God. As they came nearer yet, there is a tradition that Rodrigo, looking on the Moslem, said, By the faith of the Messiah, these are the very men I saw painted on the walls of the cave at Toledo. Yet he certainly bore himself like a king, and he rode on the battlefield in a chariot of ivory lined with gold, having a silken awning decked with pearls and rubies, while the vehicle was drawn by three white mules abreast. 
He was then nearly eighty, and was dressed in a silken robe embroidered with pearls. He had brought with him, in carts and on mules, his treasures in jewels and money, and he had trains of mules whose only load consisted of ropes to bind the arms of his captives. So sure was he of making every Arab his prisoner. Driving along the lines, he addressed his troops boldly, and arriving at the centre, quitted his chariot, put on a horned helmet, and mounted his white horse, Aurelio. This was before the invention of gunpowder, and all battles were hand to hand. On the first day, the result was doubtful, and Tariq rode through the Arab ranks, calling on them to fight for their religion and their safety. As the onset began, Tariq rode furiously at a Spanish chief, whom he took for the king, and struck him down. For a moment it was believed to be the king whom he had killed, and from that moment new energy was given to the Arabs. The line of the Spaniards wavered, and at this moment the whole wing of cavalry, to which Lewis belonged, rode out from its place and passed on the flank of the army, avoiding both the Spaniard and Arab. "'What means this?' said Lewis to the horseman by his side. "'It means,' was the answer, "'that Bishop Opas is betraying the king.' At this moment, Don Alonso rode up and cheered their march with explanations. No more, he said, will we obey this imbecile old king who can neither fight nor govern. He and his troops are but so many old women. It is only these Arabs who are men. All is arranged with Tariq, and we will save our country by joining the only man who can govern it. Lewis groaned in dismay. It seemed to him an act of despicable treachery. But those around him seemed mostly prepared for it, and he said to himself, after all, Don Alonso is my chief. I must hold by him. So he kept with the others, and the whole cavalry wing followed Opus to a knoll, whence they watched the fight. It soon became a panic. The Arabs carried all before them, and the king himself was either killed or hid himself in a convent. Many a Spaniard of the seceding wing of cavalry reproached himself afterwards for what had been done, and while the archbishop had some influence with the conquering general, and persuaded him to allow the Christians everywhere to retain a part of their churches, Yet he had, after all, the reward of a traitor in contempt and self-reproach. This he could bear no longer, and organising an expedition from a Spanish port, he and six minor bishops, with many families of the Christians, made their way towards Gibraltar. They did not make their escape, however, without attracting notice and obstruction. As they rode among the hills with their long train, soldiers, ecclesiastics, women and children, they saw a galloping band of Arabs in pursuit. The archbishop bade them turn instantly into a deserted castle they were just passing, to drop the portcullis and man the walls. That they might look as numerous as possible, he bade all the women dress themselves like men, and tie their long hair beneath their chins to resemble beards. He then put helmets on their heads and lances in their hands, and thus the Arab leader saw a formidable host on the walls to be besieged. In obedience, perhaps, to orders, he rode away, and after sufficient time had passed, the archbishop's party rode onward towards their place of embarkation. Lewis found himself beside a dark-eyed maiden who ambled along on a white mule, and when he ventured to joke her a little on her late appearance as an armed cavalier, she said coyly, "'Did you think my only weapons were roses?' Looking eagerly at her, he recognised the laughing face which he had once seen at a window, but ere he could speak again, she had struck her mule lightly and taken refuge beside the archbishop, where Lewis dared not venture." He did not recognise the maiden again till they met on board one of the vessels which the Arabs had left at Gibraltar, and on which they embarked for certain islands, of which Opas had heard, which lay in the Sea of Darkness. Among these islands they were to find their future home. The voyage, at first rough, soon became serene and quiet. The skies were clear, the moon shone, the veils of the Spanish maidens were convenient by day and useless at evening, and Lewis had many a low-voiced talk on the quarter-deck with Juanita, who proved to be a young relative of the archbishop. It was understood that she was to take the veil, and that, young as she was, she would become by and by the lady abbess of a nunnery to be established on the islands, and as her kinsman, though severe to others, was gentle to her, she had her own way a good deal, especially beneath the moon and the stars. For the rest, they had daily services of religion, as dignified and sonorous as could have taken place on shore, except on those rare occasions when the chief bass voice was hushed in seasickness in some cabin below. Beautiful Gregorian masses rose to heaven, and it is certain that the Pilgrim Fathers, in their two months on the Atlantic almost a thousand years later, had no such rich melody as floated across those summer seas. Lewis was a favourite of Opas, the Archbishop who never seemed to recognise any danger in having an enamoured youth so near to the demure future abbess. He consulted the youth about many plans, 
Their aim, it seemed, was the great island called Antilia, as yet unexplored, but reputed to be large enough for many thousand people. Opus was to organise the chief settlement, and he planned to divide the island into seven dioceses, each bishop having a permanent colony. Once established, they would trade with Spain, and whether it remained Moorish or became Christian, Opus was sure of friendly relations. The priests were divided among the three vessels, and among them was that occasional jarring from which even holy men are not quite free. The different bishops had their partisans, but none dared openly face the imperial Opus. His favourite Lewis was less formidable, he was watched and spied upon, while his devotion to the dignified Juanita was apparent to all. Yet he was always ready to leave her side when Opus called, and then they discussed together the future prospects of the party, when they should see land, whether it would really be Antilia, whether they should have a good landfall, whether the island would be fertile, whether there would be native inhabitants, and if so, whether they should be baptised and sent to Spain as slaves, or whether they should be retained on the island. It was decided on the whole that this last should be done, and what with the prospect of winning souls and the certainty of having obedient subjects, the prospect seemed inviting. One morning, at sunrise, there lay before them a tropic island, soft and graceful with green shrubs and coconut trees, and rising in the distance to mountains, whose scooped tops and dark furrowed sides spoke of extinct volcanoes, yet not so extinct, but that a faint wreath of vapour still mounted from the utmost peak of the highest among them. Here and there were seen huts covered with great leaves or sheaves of grass, and among these they saw figures moving and disappearing, watching their approach, yet always ready to disappear in the recesses of the woods. Sounding carefully the depth of the water with their imperfect tackle, they anchored off the main beach, and sent a boat on shore from each vessel, Lewis being in command of one. The natives at first hovered in the distance, but presently came down to the shore to meet the visitors, some even swimming off to the boats in advance. They were of a yellow complexion, with good features, were naked except for goat skins or woven palm fibres, or reeds painted in different colours, and were gay and merry, singing and dancing among themselves. When brought on board the ships, they ate bread and figs, but refused wine and spices, and they did not seem to know the use of rings or of swords when shown to them. Whatever was given to them, they divided with one another. They cultivated fruit and grain on their island, reared goats, and seemed willing to share all with their newly found friends. Lewis, always thoughtful and somewhat anxious in temperament, felt many doubts as to the usage which these peaceful islanders would receive from the ship's company, no matter how many bishops and holy men might be on board. All that day there was exploring by small companies, and on the next the archbishop landed in solemn procession. The boats from the ships all met at early morning, near the shore, the sight bringing together a crowd of islanders on the banks, men, women and children, who, with an instinct that something of importance was to happen, decked themselves with flowers, wreaths and plumes the number increasing constantly, and the crowd growing more and more picturesque. Forming from the boats, a procession marched slowly up the beach, beginning with a few lay brethren carrying tools for digging, then acolytes bearing tall crosses, and then white-robed priests. The seven bishops being carried on litters, the archbishop most conspicuously of all. Solemn chants were sung as the procession moved through the calm water towards the placid shore, and the gentle savages joined in kneeling while a solemn mass was said, and the crosses were uplifted which took possession of the newfound land in the name of the church. These solemn services occupied much of the day. Later they carried tents on shore, and some of them occupied large storehouses, which the natives had built for drying their figs. And to the women, under the direction of Juanita, was allotted a great airy cave with smaller caves branching from it where the natives had made palm baskets. Day after day they laboured transferring all their goods and provisions to the land, tools and horses and mules, clothing and simple furniture, most of them joined with pleasure in this toil, but others grew restless as they transferred all their possessions to land. And sometimes the women, especially, would climb to high places and gaze longingly towards Spain. One morning a surprise came for Lewis. Every night it was their custom to have a great fire on the beach and to meet and sing chants around it. One night Lewis had personally put out the blaze of the fire, as it was more windy than usual, and went to sleep in his tent. Soon after midnight he was awakened by a glare of a great light upon his tent's thin walls, and, hastily springing up, he saw their largest caravel on fire. Rushing out to give the alarm, he saw a similar flame kindled in the second vessel, and then after some delay in the third. Then he saw a dark boat pulling hastily towards the shore, and going down to the beach he met their most trusty captain, who told him the ships had been burned by order of the archbishop, in order that their return might be hopeless 
and that their stay on the island might be forever. There was some lamentation among the emigrants when they saw their retreat thus cut off, but Lewis, when once established on shore, did not share it. To be near Juanita was enough for him, though he rarely saw her. He began sometimes to feel that the full confidence of the archbishop was withdrawn from him, but he was still high in office, and he rode with Opus over the great island, marking it out by slow degrees into seven divisions, that each bishop might have a diocese and a city of his own. Soon the foundations began to be laid, and houses and churches began to be built, for the soft volcanic rock was easily worked, though not very solid for building. The spot for the cathedral was selected with the unerring eye for a fine situation, which the Roman Catholic Church has always shown, and the adjoining convent claimed, as it rose, the care of Juanita. As general superintendent of the works, it was the duty of Lewis sometimes to be in that neighbourhood, until one unlucky day when the two lovers lingering to watch the full moon rise were interrupted by one of the younger bishops, a black-browed Spaniard of stealthy ways, who had before now taken it upon himself to watch them. Nothing could be more innocent than their dawning loves, yet how could any love be held innocent on the part of a maiden who was the kinswoman of an archbishop and was his destined choice for the duties of an abbess? The fact that she had never yet taken her preliminary vows, or given her consent to take them, counted for nothing in the situation. Though any experienced lady superior could have told the archbishop that no maiden could be wisely made an abbess until she had given some signs of having a vocation for a religious life. From that moment the youthful pair met no more for weeks. It seemed always necessary for Lewis to be occupied elsewhere than in the cathedral city. As the best architect on the island, he was sent here, there, and everywhere, and the six other churches rose with more rapidity because the archbishop preferred to look after his own. The once peaceful natives found themselves a shade less happy when they required to work all day long as quarrymen or as builders. But it was something, had they but known it, that they were not born away as slaves, as happened later on other islands to so many of their race. To Lewis they were always loyal for his cheery ways, although there seemed to be a change in his spirits as time went on. But an event happened which brought a greater change still. A Spanish caravel was seen one day, making towards the port and showing signals of distress. Lewis, having just then found an excuse for visiting the cathedral city, was the first to board her, and was hailed with joy by the captain. He was a townsman of the youths, and had given him his first lessons in navigation. He had been bound, it seemed, for the Canary Islands, and had put in for repairs, which needed only a few days in the quiet waters of a sheltered port. He could tell Lewis of his parents, of his home, and that the northern part of Spain, under Arab sway, was humanely governed, and a certain proportion of Christian churches allowed. In a few days the caravel sailed again at nightfall, but it carried with it two unexpected passengers. The archbishop lost his architect, and the proposed convent lost its unwilling abbess. From this point, both the island of the seven cities and its escaping lovers disappear from all definite records. It was a period when expeditions of discovery came and went, and when one wondrous tale drove out another. There exist legends along the northern coast of Spain, in the region of Santander, for instance, of a youth who once eloped with a high-born maiden and came there to dwell. But there may have been many such youths and many such maidens, who knows? Of Antilia itself, or the island of seven cities, it is well known that it appeared on maps of the Atlantic, sometimes under the one name and sometimes under another, six hundred years after the date assigned by the story that has here been told. It is said by Fernando Columbus to have been visited by a Portuguese sailor in 1447, and the name appeared on the globe of Behaim in 1492. The geographer Toscanelli, in his famous letter to Columbus, recommended Antilia as likely to be useful to Columbus as a way station for reaching India, and when the great explorer reached Hispaniola, he was supposed to have discovered the mysterious island, whence the name of Antilles was given to the group. Later, the first explorers of New Mexico thought that the Pueblos were the seven cities, so that both the names of the imaginary island have been preserved although those of Luis de Vega and his faithful Juanita have not been recorded until the telling of this tale. End of chapter 15. Recording by Timothy Ferguson, Gold Coast, Australia.